live on WFLA Now. Feel good and live your best life with Bloom Health Club. Here's Gail Guayardo. The countdown to Paris is on. We are now just weeks away from the 2024 Summer Olympics. And three-time Olympic champion Brooke Bennett is keeping her finger on the pulse of what's happening as millions of spectators get ready to cheer on the world's top athletes. Brooke Bennett, thanks for joining us again on the Bloom Health Club podcast. It's great to be here. And I think my favorite thing that you said during that open is uh, the millions of spectators that are going to be at this Olympics. And so how different is that going to feel um, if we recall how it was in Tokyo. And it seems so oddly to say that it was only three years ago, but all of those venues were empty of spectators. So mm -hmm. it was everybody watching it, you know, at home and, and streaming it. But now spectators are going to swarm into Paris for these couple of weeks. They're probably already starting to feel that um, as the athletes start to arrive. And then family members are going to be able to be there to watch their sons and daughters and you know whoever compete you know and many of the olympians are moms and dads too yeah. so i think this is a, a very exciting time as always so exciting and, and speaking of exciting you know we have kind of big news that we're trying to spread and that is that brooke bennett has partnered with jb buno our wfla now anchor and you guys are going to be deep diving, pun intended, yeah. into all things Olympics. And this is going to be available to all of our Next Star Nation stations and digital platforms. It's it's huge. Um, I just got that information this morning. So where the conversation was brought up, I want to say it was early um, within this year of the idea of doing a podcast. And I... You know, of course, I knew a podcast where I had been on a few, but really didn't get the dynamics of um, kind of just having free range to talk as much as you want and be very conversational. And so we started talking about it and we've done a few um, episodes already leading up to what's hot in Paris. And now um, I guess we've done a pretty good job that we get to possibly be in 170 plus markets. That is super, super exciting. And really, there's so much to talk about, especially what's going on behind the scenes. And you keep your finger on the pulse. You talk to some of our top athletes, and we have quite a few mm -hmm. uh, Florida athletes representing us this year. We we do. And again, so I always like that the numbers game is, is fun. So I did a little, started to do a little bit of research and follow along. Um, so we have um, locals competing in seven different sports. Um, we have 39 athletes that are going to be competing in Paris from the state of Florida. Um, USA can have as many as 800 athletes competing and there will be 32 sports competing and 28 of those being those core Olympic sports. So when you say core, you're talking aquatics, you're talking track and field, and you're talking gymnastics. Um, so that's kind of the, the start. But, um, you know, I'm going to get ready to uh, geek out pretty, <laughs> pretty hard here on like Olympics, Olympics, Olympics. And now you guys have given me a reason to do this. I have an excuse. Yeah, yeah. And you've already done. Yes. Yeah, because you, you we don't really need an excuse, but we're just <laughs> going to fuel the fire. I know that um, you and JB Buno have already done, you know, work together and you had the opportunity to interview, you know, top locals like Bobby Fink. So yeah. uh, we have him coming up on a show next week. Tell me a little bit about his, his headspace right now. Well, and here, interesting enough, I mean, Bobby is from uh, Clearwater, um, grew up swimming at St. Pete Aquatics, and he has two older sisters that swam autumn and summer both d1 athletes so it's a it's a family of swimming um his mom was the distance swimmer as well never quite made it to the olympic games so there's there's a lot of uh genetics and a lot of athletics in that family so when his sisters were competing it was more towards the end of my career because i'm still much older than them um i remember 
um, autumn and summer coming up to me on the pool deck and wanting to get their picture taken with me and meeting the entire family. And uh, Jeannie Fink, Bobby's mom, points over and she goes, oh, yeah, this is our youngest. This is Bobby. And he had to have been like five years old at the time. Wow. And she said, oh, he he has no idea about swimming. He's completely clueless. He's he's such a boy. He's into dinosaurs and trucks. <laughs> and then fast forward all these years and then going into Tokyo we start to hear this name um he was at UF swimming and then all of a sudden he he kind of came out of nowhere it, he had like a a chance but he wasn't a favorite going into 2020 um and I when I was watching the uh, the coverage at the trials at the end of June interesting enough when we talked about this and I remember we heard a lot about because Tokyo was delayed. You know, it's the 2020, but it happened in 21. Um, and Bobby said something very interesting, which it kind of made me go back and think about this. And we talked about this a little bit already. He said the key to his success in 21 was the extra year to mature. Mm. But how many, and that was the big thing. Like you're so ready to go because everything is like the mindset of the quad, the mm. four, the four, and then it becomes five. Right. And so the advantage that he had to get a little bit stronger and a little bit more mature was to his advantage. And then now the short, the shortened part that it's really only three years now he's, you know, you, you're, you haven't aged as much as when you just did it. So I think it can work to their advantage ag again. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, again, I think sometimes 2021 seems so long ago in the bubble that we were living in mm -hmm. for, yes. for COVID. And now it's going to be completely different. But not just being a local kid, the local hero. Yeah. Um, I certainly know that feeling because the Tampa Bay area treated me the same so I want to give now that I'm in the chair that I'm in I want to give him as much as the feeling that you guys gave me right, right? Yes. that he is our defending two-time Olympic champion in the 800 meter freestyle and the 1500 meter freestyle which makes me even more excited because it's the distance freestyle events which is what I swam so I'm like yes that we're producing another Olympian Olympic gold medalist in distance swimming right here in the Tampa Bay area, not just the state, but like I grew up in Plant City and he grew up in Clearwater. Mm. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That is incredible. It must and be I, something in the water. Yeah, I like something that. Something in the water. <laughs> that is very funny. And I, I, I am so glad that you shared the backstory of, of, of Bobby that, you know, he kind of came, you know, he wasn't maybe the person that everybody pointed the spotlight at. Mm -hmm. And maybe that, you know, explains how humble he is. My interview that I had with him hasn't dropped just yet. But, man, that guy is about as down to earth as they get. Right. So did he did he sh did he tell you the story about what he carries to the block? He did not. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to let we're okay. because right. we actually JB and I got it out on our on our podcast. Okay. So I'm going to let all of our listeners know. And, you know, so we, we talk about like, do you have any pre race routines that you go through? Like I was a big listen to music. I had four songs that I listened to. Um, so he bust out in the podcast. I was literally sitting right there. And he goes, well, I carry this little bag up to the block, this little black bag. And if you're wondering what's in it, it's my rubber duckies. Oh, it's I love that. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Like you're like the, the yeah. So we, we so then at trials, they he they have an image of them and they're they're lined up right on his windowsill. And when we were on the, I go, well, where are they right now? They're in my bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is awesome. So um, at trials, the day that he was getting ready to compete in the 800, which is one of the events that he'll be defending, and he was getting ready to swim the finals, I actually happened to be at a um, event for CFY, the foundation that I work for. And it was just a very social um, go in and mingle, and people had booths set up. And I walk over, and there's a booth. And they're, you know, little tchotchkes giveaways and they have rubber duckies sitting up on the desk. And I notice that they're little minis and they're red, white and blue. So I walk oh. over and I go, can I have one of those? And I go, actually, can I have three, three of them? So I lined them up on my coffee table 
and I watched Bobby qualify for the 800. That's so awesome. I feel like I kind of contributed yeah. to the <laughs> lucky duckies. Like I'm, Spirit. you know, and I, I, I um, posted it on Instagram and I told him, I go, these can be added to your collection afterwards and I'm holding them safe for you, but I'm going to keep them through the Olympic Games. Nice. <laughs> That's beautiful. That is beautiful. And the sultry voice that you're hearing is, uh, is our guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Hello, Blue everyone. Tampa Bay. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> lead digital reporter and producer Brody Woodell and I know Brody that you've had the pleasure of talking to Brooke and interviewing her and writing articles about her do you have any questions for our champ what do you think like how do what's the mindset like leading up to and actually like li I actually I'm more interested to know what it's actually like living in that village like how does that change like being there like you're all college kids like you know what I mean like um, well, you know, and everybody always wants to know, is the Olympic Village as crazy as they say party. it is? Are they like yeah. handing out there? And I'm like, I never saw that. I don't know. I, I never saw right. it. I don't, I, you Not know. Not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, towards the end of the Olympics, and so I, I think every Olympics is different. And even in um, Tokyo and I think in Rio, the athletes, the, the Olympic Village wasn't big enough to house all the Olympians. So I think you had to move out of the village after you were done competing to allow those ones in the second week to come in. For me, Atlanta and Sydney were very different. Like we lived in the village the entire two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to respect. So for swimming, like the first week, like we start the day after opening ceremonies and then we compete for the week. But then we have a whole week to go to other um, events. We have time to celebrate. And but we have to be very respectful that there are still athletes that are there and don't compete until the very end. Um, so it is that. And for me, my favorite place to go in the Olympic Village was the cafeteria. Not to mention because it's food and it's almost it's going into like if you remember, I mean, they're not the same as like us growing up. But like when you would go into the food court at the mall mm -hmm. and it's just bigger than life mm -hmm. and you just would stand there. And you don't know where you want to go. So you kind of go around and you sample everything before you decide what you're going to get. The cafeteria in the Olympic Village is like that, because remember, you're housing the Olympians from all different countries and the cultures. So it was just fun to go in and select. And if it was there, it was there. Yeah, there was a McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, yeah, there's McDonald's in the Olympic Village. Um, but I, we didn't go until the end because all I wanted was like the French fries, oh, right? But I would go after I was done competing. But anything and everything that you want. So the food was great. Um, but at the same time, it was really where you could bump in and you could see some of those other like superstar athletes that I was never going to get exposed to like a Shannon Miller. Mm -hmm. um, I bumped into Muhammad Ali in the Olympic cafeteria uh, in yeah. Atlanta. That was when I met him and he was just sitting there and very kind. And that was my interaction with him. So that is kind of your opportunity to kind of like look around and kind of name drop it would be like walking down the street and seeing like your favorite movie star and you're like yeah. wow. wow did you see who just walked by um you got to do that in the uh cafeteria so that was cool right. you know i i was just reading an article um about you know how they're prepping for feeding all of these athletes they they call it the largest catering job in the yeah. world. And they mm. actually had to collab with chicken farmers, egg producing farmers, like the, 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 the magnitude of feeding that many people and support staff and all everybody that needs to be taken care of in the summer Olympics or any yeah. Olympics really is, is beyond like our scope. Well, and I, I again, um, it was 2020. So we're 24 years past my yeah. <laughs> that's another story yeah. um but very different athletes diets and i think people's diets are very different oh, i yeah. mean there's there's keto i don't even know there's there's keto and mm. there's vegan and there's vegetarian and then there's peanut out you know it just seems like there's lots more things to kind of have to deal with and you have to make sure that you know, all of the athletes are getting what they need. Like, right, isn't the cool thing, like, when a uh, movie star or the concert, like, if a Taylor Swift comes in, like, what's the one thing that she wants, like, in her dressing room or whatever? Yeah. I remember hearing one of them say that they had to have red vines, red vines, not Twizzlers. Like, yeah. that's probably kind of what they're trying to do 
yeah. there in the cafeteria. I would say if you could think it, it's probably available. That's incredible. Nice. It's like Brody. He always wants green M&Ms in the green room. That's right. I must You're have such them. You're such a diva. <laughs> do they, but do they now just make bags of like before? Like, you know, now you can go and you can get the one color. One color. Yeah. We used to have to pick them out. <laughs> that was somebody's job. <laughs> I love black jelly beans. And you're so right. um, yeah, when I was weird. working in sports broadcasting, um, I had a coworker and always around that time I would come in and there would just be a bag. She's like, yeah, I got a bag of jelly beans and I picked out all the black ones for you. Like, Aw, <laughs> thanks. Like, That's so sweet. <laughs> sweet. That is so sweet. You know, something that you and I had the opportunity to talk about, and I think you're going to love weighing in on this as well, Brody. Mm. Um, we have a great interview that's going to air with Brooke coming up uh, this Wednesday on Bloom, which is our nationally or globally syndicated health and mm -hmm. wellness show. And with the mental health of these athletes is something that is so critical. And you say that has really changed over time since you were an athlete versus what they have to deal with today. Right. Absolutely. Sports in general and what we we've seen is it's sports start as a hobby. They start as putting your kids in it to exert energy, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's a a reason why a, uh, a parent puts their child in certain things because they want to see if they'll take that path. Right. Um, now, outside of just being something that may pay for your college, it now becomes a career path, right? So, so many of these athletes are now, you know, career-based athletes. So they have a lot of pressure on their shoulders mm -hmm. to perform for their sponsorships. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of pressure to perform for how their lifestyle is going to be. Um, and before, and even back in my day, yeah, there was some money there. There was some prize money, but it was less than 1% of athletes really across the board, I would say in Olympics, that were going to make a career out of being an Olympic athlete. It, it's, the Olympics was still very different than what I would consider any of our major four pro teams, the NBA, NFL, MLB, and hockey, right? Very different. Now I see that the, the Olympics are starting to kind of come to force and there's more money for these athletes. Mm -hmm. So that's pressure. That's anxiety. That's not even just getting up to perform. And I've said this to other athletes is even as this career, as this sport becomes your career, if you lose your passion of doing it, you will not succeed. Right. So there has you have to figure out how to balance both of those. And then now you're balancing all of that for yourself. And now you're trying to close out the background noise mm. of what I call social media and that every person believes that they have an opinion and their opinion is valued. Mm. And I'm going to voice it because I know better than Simone Biles for pulling out of the Tokyo Olympics. Yeah. So I, I think these, these athletes have a lot of pressure coming. That's even different from my day. Um, Caleb Dressel, who we saw took a, a, about nine months off of swimming, was questionable if he was even going to come back and try to compete and qualify. For Paris, he did. He had a great trials. But about a week before an article came out, he, he recently got married. Um, he had a son. So he's, you know, now a husband. He's now a father. And in the article, the best line of the in, entire article is, I am human. I am humid. And that, and, and Gail, this goes for you. Like we've talked about this, you know, being a, a public profile, being a person in the, in the spotlight from giving us our news to now being on bloom, you are a human. I am a human. I know going into two weeks of what's hot in Paris, I may say something, have an opinion on something that somebody doesn't completely agree with, but I don't discredit anything that anybody's saying. Think what you want to think, but be kind to humans on what we value and our importance and our knowledge. I am not perfect. These athletes are not perfect. They are going to have um, bad races. And unfortunately, I, I would say that we're probably going to see some of their worst races of their career happen on the biggest stage, which is the Olympics. And that's how this plays out. And 
you know, I'm going to sit back here on what's hot in Paris and we want to bring the most interesting news to you each day. And I'm going to be forced to maybe cover something that is a little bit controversial or not as great. But I will promise the viewers that I will do that Mm -hmm. with the utmost respect to those athletes because they are human and Mm -hmm. they're it's it's you know, we got to report on it because it is news. It is what we want to hear about. Um, But we can do it in a kind way so that viewers get what they want and the athletes are respected. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, and uh, again, I'm not an elite (laughs) athlete, but I can say how these barbs and these things, they do impact Mm -hmm. how you feel. I mean, I've been doing this now for 36 years and I don't have thick skin Mm -hmm. and I don't think I'm ever going to. And so many people think you probably do. And I do not. And that that sucker punch, (laughs) it comes in hard. And so I can't imagine for an athlete that has to perform. And, Mm -hmm. and the other thing that I thought was so fascinating that you, you, you talk about that we'll hear more about coming up on, on Wednesday on bloom is, you know, you talk about the fact that for a lot of these athletes, they age out. Yes. So yeah. this is their time mm-hmm. to shine. And there might not be a next Olympics. Correct. So they can't have all this garbage getting. And that's exactly what the, that kind of negativity is. Yeah. It's just garbage. Mm-hmm. They can't have that in their heads. Right. And, I, you know, we saw a lot. And I, and I will even say on uh, through USA Swimming and our governing body, um, USA Swimming has worked and there's a there's a lot more conversation on that side of making sure that they're providing for the athletes on the mental health. And, I, you know, I still think there's a lot of people out there that as soon as you you mention mental health, you still get the rolls of the eyes. Right. right? We still have to perform. We still have to do and all this kind of stuff. Um, again, like how I manage what somebody says about me is very different on, on how you are. Um, and I would say probably five days out of seven, I probably can roll it off and whatever. And there's going to be that one day that literally the simplest of things said, right. That maybe not even be derogatory towards me, but I'll take it that way. And I completely break down and just melt and I just can't grasp anything other than that specific thing that somebody said about me that was their opinion and it just bothered me to the core and then I start questioning myself like Mm -hmm. what did I do am I not good enough maybe I shouldn't be doing you know so that's gonna happen to all of these athletes and we can train to do it we can train to do it we can say put the blinders the out noise go the the outside noise goes away um but again we're you know, we're all human. You're human. We're it goes all right back human. To that. And I, I, I wish and, uh, you know, I wish we can kind of go back to that, you know, and I, I'm trying with my my two boys that are nine and seven now is, you know, passing somebody good morning. I do this thing sometimes when I'm running and, and I've stopped running with headphones and hold my phone with my speaker on more of a, a safety thing mm-hmm. that I don't want to tune out too much. But sometimes just running and even running with a friend as people are walking past us, we'll say good morning. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting to know how many times you get nothing back. You get nothing back. Yeah. Yeah. And so we do it as a thing of like, you know, especially if we're going on a long run, like how many do you think we'll get? You know, and it's 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 kind of interesting on just, you know, passing somebody and just smiling. You see it all the time smile hold the door say thank you say good morning good afternoon because you never know what kind of day they're having yeah yes. and i just maybe and i i thought about this driving over as in everything that our country is going through and i that is not even a door i'm going to swing open right now but you have an idea of what i'm talking about maybe in some way the summer olympics can can bring us together as a country before we have to go through what we're going to go through in the fall um that this is our hope that coming out of you know the fourth of july so i i decorate my home for like every holiday and i from memorial day to fourth of july i'll take it down and i'll put summary stuff out so now i have fourth of july up and normally i would take it down and do summary before labor day and as i was putting it up and i told my boys i go this is going to remain out because now we're in complete red white and blue flags everywhere usa olympics oh yes yeah i mean even my shirt like 
five below my boys wanted to go and i see it up on the wall paris and i'm like gotta have it <laughs> it I makes love so it. much sense it's yeah. like i'm getting into the zone <laughs> I even my nails it. right red white and blue I know I noticed those they're so cute they're so cute and <laughs> and Brody as you know I mean Brooke gets in the zone like yes, you does. watch a lot of the, the especially swimming real time you don't you don't watch anything on repeat mm. right do you I don't no in no. fact I I've already looked out and I know like swimming is gonna be a live stream on Peacock yeah. at 2 30 so it's like I want to know you're ready I'm ready ready to go and then I'll re-watch it during prime time at seven because then I like all the feedback and all mm -hmm. the NBC affiliates and stuff talking about it and jumping from one sport to the next that's fun but now you just have to know when it's streaming and not pick up the phone and don't look at social media yeah, because right. like especially for somebody like Bobby Fink I don't want I have to watch it mm. do not spoil it for me like I will know it when he knows it and when he touches the wall I will know like I can't let anybody else break that news for me that's, that's amazing <laughs> that's amazing speaking I want to get I know you're going to be giving a lot of opinions um you know as it, it, it's like What's the name the podcast? It's what what's hot, hot in, Paris. in Paris. What's mm -hmm. hot in Paris? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to mess that up. I just found out about it myself. What's hot in so Paris? So what's hot in Paris? Um, I thought it was interesting of you and you. You can touch on this just a little bit about how different sports are interchangeable. Yeah. Related to which country is hosting or which city is hosting, mm -hmm. and this year, break dancing and rock climbing are in right and baseball and softball are, are out right right and so this is fairly new and i said this before we went on this is an area that you know i'm starting to get i need to get um, more knowledgeable on mm -hmm. um, because it's relatively new um, so if i'm wrong don't bash me on this but i want to say this really came into play going into rio where it was like we always saw the same sports compete and it goes mm -hmm. from like the original start and we have handball and we have track and field and we have wrestling and baseball and softball and then now where i even mentioned where we have 32 sports um competing and 28 of them are core so now paris had the option to select four sports um and they have to pick or choose right so i'm going to pick break dancing um so softball is out i'm going to pick rock climbing so baseball is out i'm gonna pick surfing so karate is out so now these host countries have the ability to kind of pick three or four sports that they would like to debut um surfing and skateboarding we saw in tokyo um they are returning again and then now we're going to see rock climbing and break dancing mm -hmm. And then what I know for LA 28 is LA has said that baseball and softball will be in. Interesting. So again, you kind of are going to, and, and I, again, I think that's a, an area that becomes very controversial yes. because my opinion on that is going to be very different. Um, I, I do believe that baseball, these are, these are sports. Um, this is not what I would say arts or dance. So in my opinion, and again, this may put me in the hot seat, but that's what I'm here to do. Um, I don't know where I classify breakdancing. I'm not saying it's not going to be sensational to watch. And maybe that's, that's what we're why. going for. Yeah. It's yeah. the viewers, right, on that they think that this is going to be the hot item because everybody wants to see um, how it's performed. Yeah. Um, but to me, I still think there's a different stage versus going into the Olympiads and the Olympic Games and how the Olympics were established in 1896 mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting. interesting to it'll be interesting to see i did um watch surfing um i, I i'm kind of on the the eh, i don't know and that's in uh, and that's kind of interesting maybe people are going to say well wouldn't you want it to be in because it's so water oriented and it's yeah. kind of in your your wheelhouse and i don't know i don't think that i would choose it over taking wrestling or something out of the out of the olympics that is what the olympics were established mm -hmm. on so i think that could be some good conversations on what's hot in paris and we might get some viewers to chime in 
The good thing is on What's Hot in Paris is when we're on, JB does take on questions and we do take questions from our viewers and, you know, obviously we want people to be respectful. We can filter them, but good questions deserve mm -hmm. good answers. That That's really cool. I am so glad that you're doing that. And, you know, it does bring up the whole cultural spin of right. what different people find to be interesting depending upon where you are geographically mm -hmm. on right. the map and, you and know, that makes sense like right. paris is very much yeah. into the arts and the yes. performance and that's kind of what break dancing is and you think about it like i know uh, we just interviewed a bunch of young girls that are uh, champion flag football you know and they want that to be a sport in 2028 which yeah. i believe it will be mm -hmm. and then you know, right? Rock climbing is becoming more and more. It's interesting to see how they maybe weave in mm -hmm. these newer sports or activities. Fascinating stuff. Do you have any other questions for Brooke? I don't think I do. I mean, really, one of the things that fascinates me is obviously what separates like first from second from third from 50th is the ability <laughs> to peak. And that's an art form in and of itself. Like you right. can see it in other sports, like with bodybuilding, you know, you can't just look like that all the time. Like, so what, like, talk to me about that. Like, how do you like peak? Like you can't always be improving. You have to at some point be. Right. And we've seen, and so, you know, we, uh, swimming was the middle of June towards the end of June track and field kind of mm -hmm. picked up at the tail end. So, and then gymnastics just wrapped up. So you have these athletes that are essentially peaking six to eight weeks out from the Olympic Games um, to qualify, and then they'll go back into training mode to then peak even higher. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it really comes down to the individual athlete and their coaches, because even though you see them traveling as a team, and USA Swimming, I'll give the example, two travels with up to 52 athletes, I think track and field is like 60. They all have their individual coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure on the track and field side, but in swimming, we have a staff. And there's a staff of about eight to 10 coaches. So like, for example, for me in 96, my club coach was not selected as a part of the Olympic staff. Mm -hmm. I was given a coach on the Olympic staff to follow what my coach at home sent for me to do. Now, myself and my teammate that might be in the same event as me, we may train completely different. So we have those coaches to guide us through what our club coaches, or our college coaches, or whoever is coaching us at the time. And then in 2000, my coach was actually selected as part of the Olympic staff, which was really cool. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's a plan. It's, and I always said your swimming, my swimming career was for four years, you, you lay out your puzzle and it has however many pieces of it you, you know, so <laughs> and you start flipping over the pieces and you start putting the border together, which is like year one. And so you start going mm -hmm. in. And then by the time you get ready to step up on the stage of the Olympic Games, it's that last piece and it has to fit perfect. Yeah. And it's it's the luck of the draw. It's being able to perform under pressure. It's being able to handle the anxiety and, um, you know, you know, I, I can't even say how I did it. It was just the the I think the repetition and the mindset and the zone that I was that I was in, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I had, a you know, a lot of support. Um, of course, my my coach, my, my parents were amazing, my teammates, um, you know, and then for me, I mean, it was very well known that I had lost my grandfather yes. prior to the 96 Olympics. And mm -hmm. He is still even my inspiration today on what I'm doing and asking for his help and his guidance and those types of things. But it was talked about, you know, are our trials the hardest and sometimes what they called cruel because you have to finish first or second. Mm -hmm. They do the same thing at track and at gymnastics. You have to go and perform. It has nothing to do with what you did leading up to other than the fact if you swim on this day, that is your performance and your hand has to get on the wall first or second. Your foot has to cross the finish line or you have to score the highest. Wow. And again, I don't think it's cruel and I don't think it's unfair because the Olympic Games come, there's date set. These are, this is, so you have to understand as an athlete, when the time is on, you have to be able to go. It's yeah. not a, oh, I'm going to try tomorrow. I don't feel great. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, I have COVID. We talked a little bit about yeah. that. Are the athletes going to be worried about that? Are we going to see all of a sudden 
a spike, a cold, you know, and how do athletes work through it? You have to be able to work through everything. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Again, mm -hmm. congratulations on what's hot in Paris. Everybody keep an eye out for that along with JB Buno. Well, we're going to be launching that actually. We haven't figured out how yet. We were brainstorming on it this morning, but we're going to launch our What's Hot in Paris series um, with opening ceremonies on that Friday, the 26th. So we're cool. trying to come up with a good idea on how we want to do it and engage our audience and then, of course, get everybody excited and as geeked out as me right. for the Olympics. Yay. Well, yeah. so, super excited. Thank, thank you. you for being a continued champion in Tampa Bay. And Brody, as always, thank you for riding mm -hmm. shotgun with me on Bloom Health Club. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Until next time. Thank you.